to some of the So good morning, everybody. So I will try to convince you that this is very important to work on very uh, long uh, wavelengths relief. So plateaus and plains, if you want to be able to compare the topographic and stratigraphic signal with what we see at the scale of the mantle dynamics. So I was expecting at the beginning to speak about Europe, but unfortunately I will have not so much time and we will focus mainly on Africa. So that was part of a project where uh, a lot of, of other people from Grenoble and Toulouse University were involved. So we mainly talk about uh, mountain belt, we talk about rift shoulders, but there are a lot of relief uh, in the earth that are very important. This is all the plains and plateaus or domes. And if we look all around the world, there are several of those features. Uh, the most spectacular one, and we have to discuss about it, uh, is the South African or Kalahari Plateau. But we have also a very exciting example in Brazil, the San Francisco Craton, the Serra do Mar, and, and so on, in Antarctica, uh, in India, or in, uh, uh, in Western uh, Australia. And when you look at those relief, when you arrive in Africa, it's very flat. And the characteristic of all those uh, feature is to be characterized by something that is old-fashioned geomorphology, that is planation surfaces. And I will try to convince you that you can approach planation surfaces in a different way that was done before. So we start looking at Africa. And the characteristic of Africa is to have a B-model distribution of the elevation. And you have two peaks. You have one around 100, 400 meters. And on this north-south topographic section of Africa, it corresponds to this pink line. OK, so this is the mean 300, 400 meters. And we have another peak that is between 900 and 1,100 meters. And this is this second peak line. And if you look at what it corresponds, the first one corresponds to what we can call the Sahara Plain, OK? And in the south, what corresponds to the Kalahari Plateau or the Southern African Plateau. But you have also included in that elevation what corresponds to the Ethiopian Dome, the East African Dome, or things that we have to discuss again, the Ogar, the Tibesti, and part of the Darfur, and of course, the Cameroon Volcanic Line that are included in that elevation. So the question is, what's the processes at the origin of those plateaus, those planation surfaces? And what, how we can relate that to mental dynamics. So just a, a few words about Europe, and mainly Northwest Europe, is just to show you that in, uh, in France, even it's not as much as spectacular than in Africa, we have those kind of similar, of similar features. For example, we have a very nice example of plateau that is at the border with Belgium, that is uh, the Ardennes. We have the same from the Massif Central. We have the Cornwall. And we have some in, in France. And they, they, they show the same type of structures that uh, I will show you in a couple of minutes in Africa. And I think that this is something important to work on in the next future. OK. The first thing that is obvious for some people in that room, but looking at the literature, it's not the case for everybody, is uh, please, when you look at the plateau, the age of the planation could be very different from the age of the uh, uplift. And then it means that you can get a story for the top of the plateau, and you can get another story that corresponds to uh, the growth of the relief associated with uh, this uplift. So this is something important, and I will show you a couple of examples uh, in a few minutes. OK. I don't want to do a course on the different uh, processes at the origin of uh, the planation surfaces. They are very abundant, uh, all literature. Uh, there are several processes. But in Africa, and this is also the case in Europe, is that we have mainly two types of processes that are at the origin of the planations. The first one, and I will define that in a uh, in few minutes, it's what we call the pediplane. 
and another one that we call an edge plane. And this is also the same story if you look, for example, at the Ardennes or the French Massif Central. So what's an edge plane? So this is a, a very efficient process. This is a surface that results from a weathering. This is something that is chemically controlled. So it means that the way to get a planation is that you develop laterites, okay? And because of the chemical weathering of the laterites, you, 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 you wait after millions or ten of million years, something that is flat. For the ones that are not familiar with what is a, a laterite, and we will see that uh, Africa and a lot of continents of the world are characterized by that kind of processes. So this is a kind of, sorry, uh, of crazy chemical machine with uh, two levels of evolution. The profile is getting down because of uh, base level four of all the system. We get the first weathering where all the silicate are transformed except the quartz into kaolinite. This is this white clay over there, and then a second one where everything, even the quartz, is dissolved, and what is left is only aluminum and iron, and you get the crust. And here, the next example in Namibia of this uh, second front, that is uh, the transformation, the, dis the disappearance of the kaolinite that is, uh, that is uh, eaten by the, by the crust. I have to tell you that there are few studies or no studies that explain how behave those weathering through time. There are no physical model that can explain what a weathering from mean, how it can evolve through time, and looking how important is that kind of feature. When you look at African or other continents, Brazil, same story, it's really a need to understand how it evolves through time, those kind of weathering profile, what controls the base of those weathering profile. This is something that is really poorly understood. So what is interesting is that those weathering, we can map them and we can date them. And the way to date them is what we did, is that you can do classical work. It's just looking sediments. You date the sediments above, the sediments uh, under. You can date them just by intersection of volcanics, and we lack in Africa. We have a lot of volcanics in the Ogar, in the Cameroon volcanic line, in the Virunga. So we have several places where it's possible to see weathered rocks dated and above fresh uh, volcanics, so we can date them. Another technique when you get the rocks that is manganese rich is that you can date using argon argon techniques. This is something that is very efficient. And another one that is uh, that you can get some problem with, that is paleomagnetism of the iron on the, on the crust, or the dirty crust. So this work was done by our colleagues of uh, the CEREG in Marseille, using argon argon technique and our colleagues of Rennes. And what they did in a very nice bauxite profile in Burkina Faso, they did the dating of hundreds of cryptomelans, and they shown something that is very important, is that in Africa we have two main periods of weathering, one between 59 and 45, and the second one between 24 and 29. We have other ones that are not as much as important uh, later, but this is something that is very important. And we uh, got similar results now in, uh, in Tanzania and also in the lower Congo, so it means that we confirm that those ages are really uh, African scale. So I tried to do a summary of uh, the main period of weathering in Africa and in Europe, and that are associated with planation surfaces. So in Africa, we have a very nice one uh, during uppermost Jurassic in northern Africa, Sudan, Egypt, uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, in Europe, we have this one that is very well remarked during Barimian time, and one that is really major and this is really world scale, so it means that you can find it if you are in Sweden or if you are in Patagonia. So it means that this is something that is really worldwide, and that corresponds to uh, uh, an increase of the precipitation at the time of the early Eocene climatic optimum, and we have other ones that are more local. But we will focus on this even 
because this is for us a very good marker for mapping paleo surfaces in Africa. So the second point that I want to insist on, that is also something that is a very characteristic geomorphic feature of, uh, of Africa. So this is in Namibia, but you can do the same observation in Sahara, where you want, in Ethiopia. So this is what we call the pediment and the pediplanes. So this is something that is very flat. Okay, so if you look at that, you see some uh, slight undulation. And if you look just below, just below the, the, the herbs, what you find is the rock. You have no sediment at all, or few sediments at all. And what you have is a very flat truncation surface that can truncate whatever you want, whatever the lithology. This is a kind of razor, okay? And the problem that we have is that, again, we have few physical models that explain the way the system behaves through time. Some people said that this is a kind of big sheet flood that had the origin of those structures. And I've been lucky in the past to be in the Sahara, in the, uh, in the feet of the Ogar, and to have a, a rain, a storm rain in the Ogar, and to see all the wadis uh, filled by that kind of things. And it was clearly a mixture of water and sands that was spreading all over the surfaces. Some of the people said that it could be due to a diffuse network of anastomous channels, but this is something that is, again, poorly understand, and I think that it should be something interesting to work on. So it's how it looks like. And here, for example, what you observe, this planation surface, this is a weathering profile. There are some remnants of kaolinite on top that has been removed by erosion. And this is a time of the base level fall associated with the generation, uh, the digging of this new, uh, this new erosional surface that we call the pediments. And we have upstream what bound the, 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 the system that correspond to the scarp. We also have another characteristic feature that is an inheritance of those weathering fronts that are called the Inselbergs. OK, so it now looks like a, a pediment system. You get the previous planation surface. You get a base level four. You get uh, a scarp with numerous pedivalleys. Connected to this local base level, you get a growth of rivers that connect to a large planation surface that is a plady plain. And again, I repeat, they are just thin accumulation of sediments or no sediment accumulation at all on those surfaces. It's why it's so nice to do geological map in those countries. So just an example view from a plain between Windhoek and Benjamin. So this is the, the so-called great escarpment here in Namibia. So the sea, the Atlantic Ocean is over there. Here is the scarp. And you clearly see what's the pattern. So you get a first surface over there that is a, an edge plane with some remnant of weathering. And downstream, what you have is this kind of large pedi valleys that connect to a pedi plane. You get this kind of uh, superficial uh, uh, channel network, but again, I repeat, no incisions bypassing, no real accumulation on those surfaces. So, I want just to show you that this is something important. This was a quite old map, but we found uh, a lot of, of those structures in the world, including a lot of fossil ones in Europe and in Brittany. We have, for example, a very nice uh, example of fossil pediments. I live in the fossil pediments at Rennes. OK, so this is the, 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 the point. So now, what to do with those features and how to relate that to mantle dynamics is the point that I want to show you and to convince you. So in the frame of our project, we compile a, a, a set of 27 different paleogeographic and paleoclimatic maps. And I show one of it that corresponds to these time interval between 49 and 45 that corresponds to this paroxysm of weathering. And within that period, I've taken the one that is 49, 46, because this is a period where we got a seaway coming on the Sahara. And it will be very important for uh, us when we will to discuss about the vertical movement. So it means that the Sahara, and here mainly in the, in the Niger, 
at the Niger Mali boundary, we get a shoreline that we can trace, the same in Tibesti, we have the same at the border between Egypt and Sudan. So it means that we can trace that and we can map uh, the weathering associated with that with bauxite. Here we get a small catchment along the, the, the Camun volcanic line. Bauxite again, and here a remnant relief that I have to discuss about in a couple of minutes. But please remember that we have a, a sea that is made of carbonate. So this is interesting. It works well, so it is mainly chemical erosion. So what you expect to get is chemical uh, sedimentation, then carbonates, no, or few silicic elastics, so it works well. Okay, so the work that we did is to map this surface. And what's the way to map it? So we can look at sediments, that's easy. We can look at some uh, uh, wave cut platform looking at pebble lags. It's what we did in, uh, in Niger and in, uh, in Mali. You can look at the preserved weathering profile, or you can look at the degraded weathering profile where what you observe is mainly uh, uh, is mainly Inselberg and then so on. Okay, and here on this section, you can see what's the present day geometry of this weathering profile. So if you look at that, what you see is that you're clearly going up, so it means that it's on the top of the Ogar, going down on top of the Ayer, on top of the Benue, it's almost a little bit down in the Congo Cuvette, and it's below the Calari sand and going up again in the, uh, in the Drakensberg area. So we can do exactly the same story on the east-west section. The one that is interesting is the one crossing the East African Rift, where it's possible to identify it. We did a lot of field studies in Rift Albert, Albert Rift and in Uganda where we can trace it quite well. And again, this weathering surface is going quite up in the in the, in the eastern branch to carry your rift, okay? Okay, so the question is, and that was one of the problems with the planation surfaces, is that a flat surface at the origin, and was it at sea level? Okay, this is the point, and all the old geomorphologists assumed that it was flat and that was at sea level. So the question is, what's the initial topography of this surface? So in that case, what we did, is that we look at the strut record or the geomorphological record all around the margin of Africa. We got access to several seismic lines and wells, and we were able to get ages to quantify the uplift and the idea of the, the, the things. And so the way we did that is to look at the stepping of the pediments, dated pediments by ore uh, argon argon technique, or by intersection with sediments, or by intersection with volcanics. So it means that we were able to get ages and then to discuss what's the timing of the base level fall. Or something that is easier for stratigraphers is just to look at the seismic lines, uh, well dated, and to look at what we call the forced regression wedge that corresponds to a downward migration of the shoreline. And you can quantify here the amplitude of this shoreline migration. And if it is higher than 100 meter, you're sure that it has to be tectonic in origin. You have no static variation that are higher than 100 meter uh, at, uh, during the geological record. Okay, so it's what we do. So just a, uh, an example of what we did. This is a type of map that we, that we did. This is the mapping of the different type of planation surface pediments doing a stratigraphy and dating them. So this is for the Congo Cuvette. And we see here very nicely all those pediments involving into Incis Valley along the, the, the East African Dome. So it means that we can propose a timing for the growth of the East African Dome, for example. And we can see that we can have local base level in the Congo that is different from the one in the from the one in the Atlantic Ocean. So a lot of things like that. Okay. And now, if I start to discuss about the uplift and really the process, and I will start by the African surface in Sahara. You remember the one where we sure that the sea was between 49 and 46. So what's the way to quantify the uplift? So we know where is the present day elevation of the shoreline. 
Okay? It's between 330 and 370 million years. Okay? We can get an idea about where was the sea level at that period. So we got different reconstruction, the one of Ack, that we don't know from where is coming the data, and a lot of new data coming from different authors based on ocean volume measurements, 1D backstripping, continent flooding, the work of Dave Rowley, ice volume, and then so on. And if you look, most of them agree about a, a sea level between 30 and 90 meters uh, uh, at that period. Everybody agreed that Ack is overestimated. And then, here, by difference, you can have an idea of how much was the uplift in that area. And we got something that is between 150 and 20 meters, according to the, 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 the type of uh, data that we care about. So I give you the answer before to convince you that it's how it evolved to uh, this time what happened in the Calari Plateau. The Calari Plateau is a two-step evolution, but it's quite continuous. So we get the first uplift during late Cretaceous time, something that it looks a more quiet period, and again, something that corresponds to a more recent uplift. And the way we did that work with Jean Braun is just looking at seismic line, doing sediment measurements about Africa. And we did two things. What you have here is a measurement on seismic line on the increase, the age of the increase of the sediment supply. That's everywhere at the same age, 95, 90 million years. Here, based on forced regression wages, what we've shown with Jean is that the age is older here, but the same that the, 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 the sorry, the same that the one corresponding to the sediment reflex, and getting younger is this way. So this means that the African continent was first tilted this way. You create the drainage and you get the sediment supply, and then you tilt something this way. Okay, and we did simulation with Jean to, uh, to validate this model. So an idea about the sediment budget. So this is based on a very nice database of seismic line. So we were able to quantify the volume. And here, for example, in the orange, we got incredible value between 1.9 and 2.3 million cubic kilometers. That's a lot. To give you an idea, the Nile is around 1.9. Okay, The Congo is 1.6. So it's a quite huge amount of sediments on a catchment that is much more smaller than the two other ones. And we try to quantify, we try to quantify that. Uh, the amount of denudation is between 2 and 2.5 kilometers. Just to show you how we use the strat technique to quantify the, the, uh, the, uh, the uplift. So this is a, an example of a place that I love. It's full of diamond, but this is not for this reason that I like it, is that there are a lot of uh, stratigraphic data available in that area. And here to show you a complete example from onshore to offshore is that here just uh, around 34 to 38 to 34 million years is, is the shoreline. Okay, So you can see that on the field. So you get first weathering profile, the African. Marine flooding, delta propagation, major inconformity, Aeolian staff, second large height. So it's always the evolution of this area. Okay, and using seismic line, we're able to say where is the next shoreline. Okay, so just to show you on shoreline. So this is a delta, and you can see the offlap break migration. Have an idea, and then. Between the initial position and the end position, you have an idea of what's the amount of uplift. Keep in mind that it was later tilted, so it means that this is slightly overestimated, and we are working on that, but the amount of uplift is between 400 and 500 meters. Okay, so this is the way we quantify this uplift. And this uplift at 40, 40 to 35 million years is something that is really African scale. So it means that we have to find something. So briefly, what's the cause? 
So the uplift of the Sahara for us is, uh, is quite simple. It was published by Alessandro Forte. So this is uh, uh, the, the growth of this uh, kind of hot stuff uh, below, the, below the, the Sahara. And what you have is, uh, this is the source of the Ogar, Tibet Sea of all the volcanic area. And the idea is that this system has to arrive below Africa somewhere between 40, 35 million years. And this is really the beginning of the uplift. And probably what you see here, sorry, is uh, all what is due to this dynamic topography effect. And this is probably the, the cause of the uplift of all the Sahara. Talking now about the South African plateau, what we did with uh, Jean and some colleagues of the De Beers um, is to do a compilation of all the kimberlites. Uh, the kimberlites, you know, are volcanic rocks um, that uh, come directly from uh, uh, the, the mantle. And what we observe is that you have age migration from the east to the west through time. And then, based on the observation that we did before, and looking at where is the location of this kimberlite emission zone, based on the movement of Africa, what we propose is that this is the South African superplume that is at that location, and that you have migration of the superplume. And you have a sketch that summarizes this, uh, this story. So it means that you have the birth of the South African superplumes. You have migration of Africa, and Africa is climbing up. So it means that it has to tilt on one side, and then, because it migrates, it has to be horizontal later. And it's the way we explain this, to this topography in South. OK, so this one will be for another time. OK, so this is time for confusion and perspective. So I think that this is very, very important to work on those planation surfaces if we want to understand long to very long wavelength processes. And in Europe, we have such surfaces. And it's very important to work on them, even, of course, this is not the same wavelengths. So this is something that is important. Something that we forgot, and this is particularly true in Europe, is that the climate of Europe or the climate of the world was very different in past geological time. For example, you have to imagine that in Europe, before the Pliocene, that was hot, humid, and arid. So it means that all the topography of Europe was shaped in a different climatic pattern than the present day one. The temperate climate is something young. We have to think that Europe was humid or arid in hot conditions. We have to think about different processes of erosion. So this is something that is very important. And unfortunately, a study, new results showed that this is not as much as important that expected by Bilalak and other people. So thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you, Francoise. Time for a last round of questions before we close the, the meeting. Unless you are too hungry. Yes, Laurent? And then Sean, who is frustrated from the last time. <laughs> okay, thank you, Francois. Um, I really like the story of the, uh, of the uh, uplift of the, um, of, uh, of the African plateau, uh, the Jean story, uh, etc. But I w um, so when we think about dynamic topography in Africa, we always think about uplifts and domes, etc. Do you do you see the uh, do you have any evidence of the counterparts of subsidence because it. Two uplifts should be associated with subsidence at the same time somewhere. Could it be? Could it? Could it partly explain the uh, the the, uh, the flat areas, the flat and, 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 and lower elevation areas? Is there any contribution from no, down that's, dwellings? That's difficult to answer this question because you know, on, on on one side of Africa, on the South African plateau, is that we have a major fracture zone that corresponds to the Agulhas fracture, fracture zone, and most of the of the margin are more or less controlled by those faults. So we don't know what is due to what. But this is something that we plan to do with the next project called Pamela that we, uh, that we are starting now. And it will take five years to survey all the Mozambique channels. So the answer in a couple of years. Sean? Uh, about the age of your laterites, you showed us a spectrum of argon-argon uh, ages uh, I didn't understand how you were picking two time periods as being dominant when it looked like you have a complete spectrum of ages at all ages. 
So what happened is that when you get a weathering profile, you never stop the weathering. So this is something that is very important. And this is the case for all those planation surfaces. They, they, they evolve all the time. And what you observe is that you get two migration of the, of the front. You get one going down this way and one going down this way. So it means that what did colleagues doing that thing is that they pick cryptomelan all along the profile. So it means that you have to have a drilling if you want to get access to that. And they look at the edges along, along the profile. Okay? So it means that the younger edges are the base and the older on the top. Okay? And this is just looking at the, 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 the distribution along the well and just a measurement of the frequency that you can estimate the, para, the different period of weathering. But the weathering profile all the time evolves. Even today, they evolve. So it means that you never stop the weathering. There, there are periods where you increase the weathering, and it's where you get a maximum of frequency of ages. Or you get something like that. For example, we're now dating a, a new one uh, in, uh, in, uh, the, in, the, in the plateau, in the South African plateau. And in that case, it started only in the Miocene time because everything was removed before. So we got Miocene and all the small Pliocene ages. But it evolves all the time. It never stops. Claudio? view of uh, uh, just a very naive question. Uh, I mean, of course, this uh, planetary surface is moving laterally, and the gradient you show is very low. I mean, yeah. uh, so why we that, do we have to assume that it was just really flat? I did not say that this is flat. I did you not say, say that this is flat. Forge, so say that. I said that it is deformed. I did not say that it was flat, and I don't care yeah, that it is flat. What, why, why do we have to retro uh, deform? Uh, and, and I'm sure that in the South African plateau, because we now mapped remnant of the South African plateau, that the weathering profile was draping the remnant of the, of the South African plateau. So it means that in parts that was flat and near sea level, and in other parts, it was not flat, and it was quite up. But it means that later, it was again uplifted. Right. Okay. But I never said that it was a sea level and flat, and I'm sure this is not the case. Okay, no, I understood you read the form. No, no, I, I was asking the question because that was the hypothesis of the old authors, saying that everything was flat and at sea level. And in South Africa, this is wrong. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, Barbara? Um, how does your model compare to uh, thermochronological ages that have been um, published in It fits well. Africa. So it means that uh, people publish uh, a lot of denudation. Uh, this is the work of Kerry Gallagher or Peter in the back and uh, Rod Brown and all those people that that's shown down. that there are a lot of uh, denudation uh, during uh, late Cretaceous time. This is the, 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 the paper of Rebecca <coughs> Flowers on the on the on the helium that is much more interesting because she can really uh, link that to the different age of kimberlites and that uh, she shown that the maximum of uh, denudation was around 70 million years in the place where she worked that is exactly in agreement with what we observe so it means it fits well so the problem is that the last denudation we don't see the, the last uplift sorry we don't see it because we have no denudation and the explanation is from my point of view, quite simple, is that we get a strong aridification of Southern Africa since uh, 15 million years. And then if you look at the present day landscape of Africa, few things happen. So if you look at the amount of sediments coming from all the rivers, it's almost nothing. Thank you. Okay. Any other question? Peter, maybe the last one. Yeah, Francois, I, I really like the South African model as well, but I'm wondering what's happening after 70 million years. Why is it just sitting on this super swell? When is it going to slide off? Yeah, the, this is a, I have no answer, but this is, this is the point. So it means that this is, on the, this is on the super plume. We got a very hot, humid climate, so it means that you can remove a lot of sediments. But it's clear, looking at the track record again, that at the time of paroxysm of the weathering, we don't see any clastic coming in the basin. So, and then we say, why 
the, the super boom is still below, why nothing happened? And when he starts again at 45 million years. But at 45 million years, and probably this is the answer, is that this is only located on the margin, around the margin. This is not located over the whole continent. This is really something that is really located. And maybe it's for some reason that I don't understand, something that is you initiate the erosion around the escarpment, and just by isostatic rebound, you create this topography. This is a possible scenario. Okay, well, thank you very much for all participants of the, this morning. And on behalf of...